did I wrote music to it last night. So good morning. Welcome to our worship service. We are reinstigating, or whatever you want to call it, um, kind of this system of keeping track of those who attend worship here. So at the inside chair of each row, you have one of these record of fellowship booklets. And inside the little plastic booklet, you have record of fellowship. And also there's a prayer card or so. What we would like you to do is sometime during the course of the, the worship service, um, if the sermon is boring, I suppose you can do it during the sermon. <laughs> or if the, the hymn is unsingable or, or whatever, <clears throat> if you'd fill in as much as you can there, and we ask this of visitors today um, as well, and you'll notice the yellow or so prayer form. If you have a prayer request, you can fill it out. And the attendance, the record of fellowship, as they call it, and the prayer request form can go in the offering plate. So those of you who, who contribute digitally or, or once a month or whatever, um, you'll have something to put in the offering plate when it comes by. <laughs> For some, that's kind of reassuring. Um, and then we'll ask the ushers to kind of segregate the, the prayer request forms. So so I don't have to go through the offering envelopes um, necessarily to, to find if there are any prayer requests. OK. Um, any questions, comments, suggestions before we begin? You know, we, the theme for this morning, I'm, I'm sure, is a popular one, repentance. We all like to repent, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, Advent has an, a repentance component to it. Now, normally we think of what's the repentance, the penitential season of the church year? It's Lent, isn't it? And during Lent, um, the, the color of the Pyramids and the stole that the pastor wears, if he's using a, a stole, is purple. And it used to be that during Advent, it was purple too. And so it's, it's kind of evolved where a lot of churches use blue. I've never had a blue one until um, this, this morning. Nancy found somewhere a blue one for me. Um, not that you need a stole, not that you need vestments. You'll go to a number of churches and they'll even be not in a business suit, but just in casual wear and in jeans and tennis shoes and so forth. So that's not the important thing. But, but sometimes it's kind of nice or, or some do find it more worshipful, um, more... Um, you might say spiritual, to have pyramids, vestments, stoles, and so forth. So this is the most beautiful stole I think I've ever used. So um, it, it means that Advent is a time of being repentant, of kind of introspection, even though it may not have that strong focus that it does during Lent. And you notice in the Advent wreath that we have a pink candle. When do we use the pink candle? Anybody know when we use the pink candle? Next week. And it's kind of like 
yes, the Advent season has this penitential component. But you know, we Christians, while we, we are repentant and we bow down before the holy God, it's not like we're always hanging our head down, are we? Because we hear the words of God's forgiveness, his mercy, his cleansing, and we rejoice. And it's like in Advent. We Christians can't go for four Sundays in a row that are kind of um, more subdued because of the repentant theme. So the third Sunday of the four Sundays in Advent, we have the pink candle. So let us open with a word of prayer, and then we'll proceed with our formal worship service. Father, we thank you for each one here. You know our struggles, you know our ups and downs, you know our hurts, our pains, our emptiness, our fears, our concerns. And we know that you have fully met them in Jesus Christ, that you are the one thing needful. We pray for your Holy Spirit to help us to be introspective in the sense that we look at our life and, and are able to recognize our shortcomings and failures and rejoice in the forgiveness of sins that you give us as we repent and put our trust, our confidence in you. May your Holy Spirit guide and direct us in our worship this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. The brightness of a shining star has long been a symbol of the Advent season. In Jesus, we see the morning star who fulfills the words of Scripture. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Echoing the words of faithful Christians of centuries ago, we speak this antiphon. O day spring, splendor of light, come and enlighten those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. We have the lighting of the Advent candle. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And we join in the song, Light One Candle.
pitiful brother, gentle and kind, a friend like no other. On a cross he suffered to save us, and upon Easter new life he gave us. Here we are now, our faith we're confessing. Here we are now, our love we're expressing. Here we are now, sent forth by God's blessing. Thankfully, our praises we bring unto God, our heavenly King. Spirit, Spirit, great sanctifier, give us your power, set us on fire, claim us, name us, equip and inspire, show us our place in the heavenly choir. Here we are now, our faith we're confessing. Kind of in light of our Advent worship, with this emphasis to some degree on penitence, we have the confession and absolution. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And we take a moment of silence to reflect on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion 
in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray, stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the readings for the day. Good morning. The first reading is from Malachi chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to you, come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will, set a, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver <clears throat> and will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppose the hard work, oppress the hard workers in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, children of Jacob are not consumed. From the days of our fathers, you have turned aside from your statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at the second verse. Thanksgiving and prayer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all the making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who became a good work in you will bring it to, a, to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are the partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discrimination, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. We 
we stand for the gospel. Gospel of reading is from Luke chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. It's entitled, John the Baptist Prepares the Way. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics, is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. We may remain standing for the singing of the hymn on Jordan's Bank. my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. How do you like the Christmas decorations? The beautifully decorated Christmas tree. Now, I haven't looked at it that closely, but some people on their Christmas tree, they have a big nail, like a spike. 
Now, why would somebody put a big nail on a Christmas tree? Because Jesus was that lamb that was hung on the cross. He came not merely to live, but he came to die, didn't he? He came not to be served, Mark says, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Why would God have to do something like that unless you and I were in deep trouble? And sin is deep trouble, isn't it? And it's not that we just sinned once some time ago, and then we got the message. We did a turnabout, a U-turn. We repented, and then everything was all right. You've all been in the faith long enough, haven't you, to know that it's not that clean, not that simple, that in this life, sin, evil, the devil himself is within us. Who's the terrible trio? There is sin, death, and the power of the devil. It was said that they could take the children of Israel, God's chosen people, out of Egypt. But they couldn't take Egypt out of God's people. You've experienced that too, haven't you? Isn't it strange? We, we, we come to faith. We repent of our sin. We dedicate our life to Jesus Christ. And it's like we'd think everything would be okay. We don't want to sin as we make that confession of faith, as we repent and trust in God's mercy. But in this life, it still haunts us, doesn't it? I mean, maybe not haunt, but it sticks with us. It's always there. It's like that little stone in your shoe. It's just a little thing, maybe, but it really is a big thing. None of us are perfect, are we? And we confess our sins and I remember struggling with certain sins in my life in not really being the good, loving, compliant husband that I was called to be. And I would apologize. I would confess my sin to my wife. But you know, after you do it a certain time and it doesn't end, it's more difficult for the person that's hearing our apology, our confession, to believe that we're sincere. If God were a human being, wouldn't he have a problem with that? You and I struggle with some of the same sins over and over. It's like we're, we're made to sin. We're made to do our pet sins. Now sometimes we have kind of pet sins, sins that are a little bit unique to us, but in general, there's nothing particularly unique about our sin. Oh, it occasionally has some unique expression. 
Do any of you know the name Rosario Butterfield? Rosario Butterfield? She's an author. She was a university professor, capable woman, confident woman. She was on the liberal spectrum. In fact, as an active lesbian, she was um, fairly assertive in certain areas that were in sync with her perspective. And you know, she didn't care for you all at all. She didn't like you church people, you Christians. You people who are kind of out of it and sometimes judgmental. But then she says in her book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, an English professor's journey into Christian faith. She says, in April of 1999, I felt the call of Jesus Christ upon my life. It was both subtle and blatant, like the peace inside the eye of the hurricane. I could in no way resist, and I in no way understood what would become of my life. I know, I know. How do I know it was Jesus? Maybe it was my Catholic guilt, my caffeine-driven subconscious, or last night's curry tofu. Well, I don't, but I believed and believed that it was Jesus. At this time, I was still starting to pray that God would show me my sins and help me to repent of them. I don't understand my homosexuality was a sin. Why something in the particular manifestation of same gender love was wrong in itself. But I did know that pride was a sin, and so I decided to start there. As I began to pray and repent, I wondered, could pride be the root of all my sins? I wondered, what was the real sin of Sodom? I had always thought that God's judgment upon Sodom in Genesis 19 clearly singled out and targeted homosexuality. I believed that God's judgment against Sodom exemplified the fiercest of God's judgments. But as I read more deeply in the Bible, I ran across a passage that made me stop and think. This passage in the book of Ezekiel revealed to me that Sodom was indicted for materialism and neglect of the poor and needy, and that homosexuality was a symptom and an extension of these other sins. In this passage, God is speaking to his chosen people in Jerusalem and warning them about their hidden sin using Sodom as an example. Importantly, God does not say that this sin of Sodom is the worst of all sins. Instead, God uses the sin of Sodom to reveal the greater sin committed by his own people. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor your daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. I found this passage to reveal some surprising things in it. God is comparing Jerusalem to Sodom and saying that Sodom's sin is less offensive to God than Jerusalem's. Next, God tells us what is at the root of homosexuality and what the progression of sin is. We read here that the root of homosexuality is also the root of a myriad of other sins. First, we find pride. Sodom and her daughters had pride. Why pride? Pride is the root of all sin. Pride puffs one up with a false sense of independence. Proud people always feel that they can live independently from God and from other people. Proud people feel entitled to do what they want 
when they want to. Second, we find wealth, fullness of food, and an entertainment-driven worldview, abundance of idleness. Living according to God's standards is an acquired taste. We develop a taste for godly living only by intentionally putting into place practices that equip us to live below our means. We develop a taste for God's standards only by disciplining our minds, hands, money, and time. In God's economy, what we love, we will discipline. God did not create us so that we would, as the title of an early book on postmodernism declares, amuse ourselves to death. Undisciplined taste will always lead to egregious sin, slowly and most imperceptibly. Thirdly, we find lack of mercy. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Refusing to be the merciful neighbor in the extreme terms exemplified by the Samaritan traveler to his cultural enemy left to die on the road to Jericho leads to egregious sin. Fourth, we lack we have find a lack of discretion and modesty. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Pride combined with wealth leads to idleness because you falsely feel that God just wants you to have fun. If unchecked, this sin will grow into entertainment-driven lust. If unchecked, this sin will grow into hardness of heart that declares other people's problems, no responsibility or care of your own. If unchecked, we become bold in our sin and feel entitled to live selfish lives fueled by the twin values of our culture, acquiring and achieving. And so she goes on. What do you think of our times, our culture, the world in which we live? As I look at the world around us, it seems like one of the big issues is the breakdown of the family. The family, you know, is kind of that subunit of the culture, but it determines a lot about how our children turn out. Some point to Dr. Spock, Dr. Spock in the 60s where discipline and, and kind of structure was removed from family parenting. Might be true that it had a significant impact. We can probably point to a number of other things. But as you look at the broken families in our own time. If we look at how children are not involved in the church community like they were three or four or five decades ago, hasn't it been a dramatic change? In our country at least, in Europe at least. It's amazing how attendance at churches in Europe, and now we're experiencing it in the United States, has dwindled so much. And how the world has become part of our thinking, hasn't it? For the churchgoer, for the practicing Christian, hopefully they're in the word of God as individuals, and as a group. They're in the Word of God, so the Word of God is determining their values and their lifestyle. But for many who even claim the name of Jesus Christ, it's the world that has the bigger impact. Parents sometimes lament about their children, and they think, my goodness, 
we parents only interact a relatively small, small, small amount of time with our children. We only have a limited impact. It's the teachers, the public schools, that are really the educators, the shaper of the values of our children. And sometimes those values may not be your values. The world's values obviously are not necessarily biblical values. Just like Rosario Butterfield concluded that, you know, pride and this insensitivity, this lack of love for others was really the core issue. Our desire to do it our way. I can't look into your heart. I'm not a mind reader. But I can do it to some extent in my own heart. And I realize that Rosario is right. I may at times appear to be humble to y'all, but that's a lie. I'm proud and arrogant too. And we, could I say all of us, we kind of cover up our pride, don't we? We cover up our body with clothes, we cover up our sin with other disguises. We want to put on a, ha a happy or a sad face depending upon the context. But aren't we all still sinners? Don't we all have this pride within us? A pride that wants to do it our way. We want to pursue our things. We want to spend our time the way we want to spend our time. We might seek our entertainment and spend our money as long as we're giving, quote, that 10% that they say we should give to church, we figure we've done our share. But God, who has richly blessed us, might be asking us for more, not just in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of energy, in terms of the focus of our life. I don't want to put any guilt trip on you. But, you know, as I've been reading and listening to podcasts and that sort of thing recently, I kind of shudder. You know, there are so many kids that are growing up in foster homes. They may not be group homes. But sometimes they are group homes because there aren't enough parents who will take those foster kids. And sometimes you know the parents who will take those foster kids, they're in it for the wrong reason. You know, they get compensated for that. Sometimes that's how they make a living. And sometimes their heart is not where their words are. And so I'm wondering what you and I should be doing. Obviously, we should be taking care of our own kids, and we should not be running off and doing things for others and letting our own children be unattended. But is there more that we should do? As Rosario wrote in her book, she realized that it was pride and it was this desire to, to kind of do things her way, with her assets, with her resources, that that's what she was getting from the Bible, from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. Who are the sinners? 
those who are not really reaching out to the poor and the needy. And it's not a matter of just, you know, making some financial contribution, is it? Who do you know that's hurting, that's in need of love and acceptance, affirmation, help, not just material help, but other help? And so as we look at the theme of repentance, it's not, did I commit adultery? Did I steal something? Did I lie? Did I do some of these things that we think of immediately? Because it's not so much the second table of the law, what you do unto others, that is the initial critical thing it's what role does God have in our life? If we really put God first in our life, don't these other things kind of fall into place? You can't say you love God and then not love your neighbor. That's the way Scripture puts it. You can't have these two things going together. They're inconsistent. We love because God first loved us and gave himself for us. He gave himself when he sent that babe born in the manger. But that babe born in the manger had another purpose, not just to mature and grow up and be a successful human, but to give his life a ransom for many to be that person who was nailed to the cross. Not only for the sins of the world out there, those evil people, but for the sinners in here, for us. For we too are sinners in need of repentance and forgiveness. Amen. We continue with our worship. Comfort, comfort ye my people. We stand.
And we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten night day, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we receive the offering. So keep in mind, if you would fill in the little, um, quote, attendance record, the sheet, and then the, the sheet with your name and so forth will go in the offering plate. And if you have a prayer request, the yellow form there, you can note that and put that in the offering plate too. Father, we thank you for loving us, for forgiving us, for giving us new life, for defeating sin, the evil one, and death itself. You have bought us with a price, the price of your own son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit, the good that your spirit has begun in us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will continue that even unto our last day. We pray that you will guide and strengthen us as individuals to walk in a way which is in harmony with your will. That others might see our life and give you thanks and praise to give you honor and appreciation. We thank you for having blessed us and we pray that you will enable us to be a blessing to others. We pray that not only as individuals but as the body of Christ, as a fellowship, even a fellowship here in this little congregation. 
We pray that your word will grow and increase as it did in the book of Acts in the early Christian community, that your word will grow and increase in our midst, in our community, in our state, our nation, our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up those who seek healing. We think of Richard Johnson, who's very ill in the hospital and may not even survive. We pray for Linda. We pray for Dave, for a good recovery from his heart surgery. We pray for others that we name in our hearts right now. We pray for healing of body, mind, and spirit. And we think of those who are grieving. We think of Paul Lacasse's family, Brian's friend who passed away from COVID. We pray for Brenda and the family as they grieve. We pray for Emily and her family. We pray for Irene and for others who have lost loved ones. We pray that you would comfort them, strengthen them, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they might have all joy and peace in believing, knowing that the victory has been won for us and for those who die in the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord. We pray for this fellowship. We pray for our call committee. We pray for the group that is seeking ideas and appropriate implementation. We pray for our church council. We pray for all those who are involved in this congregation. We pray that we might reach out to our community, to young people, that we might be sensitive to their situation, that we might be faithful to your word, that we might above all love and share your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray not only for our little group, but we pray for Christian churches throughout our nation, throughout our world, some have dramatically different cultures than we experience in our community. But we pray that you would work in and through whatever culture there is, that your name might be highly honored and worshiped and glorified, that your Holy Spirit might do his good work in them, even as we pray for his good work to be done in each of us. And as your son Jesus prayed that they might be one, so we pray that we might come together, that we might experience the unity of your family, the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we look at the world about us and we hear the news, we watch it on TV and the internet, and sometimes it's rather disturbing the shootings, which make no sense, the mob robberies, which really make no sense, the all, all the manifestations of sin that we see in our world, the greed of those who look so well, look so good in their suits and in their positions of status but inwardly are deceitful and are greedy. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would intervene in our world, that you would guide those who are in positions of authority, whether elected or appointed, in our country and in the countries throughout the world. We pray that there might be peace and justice, that the needs of the poor might be met, both by governments and by the church, the body of Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, 
that your good and gracious will will be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue with the communion portion of our worship. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is my blood, the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The elders will assist with distributing these individual cups. We'll all take it together. We pray that God will do a powerful work as he shares his presence in this sacrament. Take, eat, this is the body of our Lord, broken in death that we might have life and have it in all its fullness. We carefully open the wine side. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for the forgiveness of all our sin. May this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace.
we give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join in the hymn, Let It Be Said of Us. Let it be said of us that the Lord was our passion, that with gladness we bore every cross we were given, that we fought the good fight, that we finished the course, knowing within us the power of the risen Lord, let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. By mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. Till the likeness of Jesus be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. Let it be said of us, we were marked by forgiveness, we were known by our love, and delighted in meekness, we were ruled by his peace, heeding unity's call. Joined as one body, that Christ would be seen by all. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. By mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. Till the likeness of Jesus be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.